Hey everyone, it's Ross over at The Daily Jaws. In this video, Jaws novelist Peter Benchley and Jaws screenwriter Carl Gottlieb come together at one of the largest Jaws events ever held, Jaws Fest, which took place on Martha's Vineyard in 2005. In this live audience interview, Carl and Peter discuss their experiences working on Jaws, the greatest movie ever made. If you love Jaws and you want more great content, please subscribe to the channel. Okay. Let's lower those anti-shark cages and get to it. All right, we're going to begin. Carl Gottlieb uh, will will begin, and then we'll see where we go from there. And at the end, if if I don't pass out, we'll have a little uh, Q and A. <laughs> Thank you all. Welcome to this this particular event, a series of events in a series of fabulous venues that none of us had the time to actually enjoy during the months that we were here making the picture where we shuttled between sleep, food, and the set and the incomparable and in seemingly inconquerable moments that strung together actually wound up making the, the film. Uh, it's a great pleasure for us to be back on the vineyard. This is my second visit in 35, in 30 years. Uh, and the other visit was a brief one where I stood on a few sets of locations and said to the Travel Channel, yes, this was the courthouse. See this courthouse? This was the courthouse. See this office? This was an office. <laughs> this beach? It was a beach. Uh, the film was, was a triumph that was never foreseen, except that in the business, every film is a hit until it's released. Uh, and only a few of them become a hit after they're released. And we were very lucky that that happened for Jaws. Uh, Universal has uh, decided now for the 30th anniversary to release a 30th anniversary DVD reissue, which I'm very proud to be holding up in my hand here and sitting, sitting in front of the posters. It contains a two-hour documentary, which has never been seen before on DVD. Uh, it, was, um, it represents a great deal of work by uh, the kind of people who delight in finding the arcane and lost materials that are the legacy of every major motion picture. Uh, I worked from a script that was developed from another script that was developed from another script that was developed from a novel. And if it wasn't for that novel, none of us would be here. And the gentleman to my left, always a gentleman, wrote that novel. Uh, I'm very pleased to be sitting at his left hand and introducing him to you. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Peter Benchley. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, If, if I were Soviet, I would do this to, to thank you for the applause, because this, after all, you were, the, you were what made the picture the success that it was. Um, I, uh, I don't know, some of you may have heard this already, but when, when I wrote the novel, David Brown, who, with his partner Richard Zanuck, is one of the most gracious men in the business, and I, I had never been in the movie business at all before. I had no, no experience with it, whatever. And David came to me and he said, only because of your vast knowledge of, of sharks, can you alone write this screenplay? And the fact that I'd never written a movie before in my entire life didn't occur to me. It occurred to me only that David was obviously very perceptive in knowing that my knowledge of sharks was what was going to make this movie a success. So what I didn't realize was that there was a, an up and coming Writers Guild strike threatened and that because I'd never written a movie before, I wasn't a member of the Guild, and I could at least write one draft that they could then cast off of. It could be garbage, uh, but it at least was a structured draft based on the book somewhat. 
So I took instructions from Richard Zanuck, get rid of the love scenes, get rid of this romance, the adultery, the organized crime, the dead cat, forget all this stuff. This is an A to Z adventure story. Shark bites person, person chases shark, shark eats more people, people kill shark, end of story. So what I did was take, basically transliterate the novel um, into a screenplay that uh, was, I think, in, in, to be kind to it, was it was dead. It sort of lay flat on the page because it had no movie business business in it. I, thought, I didn't know how to write movie business business. And when I finally saw what, what Carl and Stephen and the actors had wrought, I began to realize the, the this enormity of difference between a novel and, and a movie. I'll give you just one example. The little bits of business that, that you see Roy Scheider do with the children at the table, uh, just playing back and forth, making gestures to one another, and this kind of thing, which really you, I couldn't write. I don't know whether Carl wrote it or whether it was all ad-libbed on the set, but it was, that's movie business business that, you, that I wouldn't have known the vaguest thing about how to write. I would write a strong narrative with a good, long, strong story, and that would carry it. But all the, the richness of detail had to come elsewhere. And when finally, after several uh, attempts by other hands, it came to Carl to work with Stephen uh, during the entire shoot. That's when uh, I venture to say it came together and, and became a movie. One of the, the contests over the years that uh, people have always asked me about and I had no answer for was, uh, how did I write that wonderful speech for Robert Shaw about the Indianapolis? And was it hard and did Shaw give me a lot of trouble with it? And uh, my answer is, I had not only didn't write it, I didn't know it existed until I saw the movie. And I thought Carl had written it, and only the only real truth that I've ever seen is in Carl's wonderful book in which he says that Shaw wrote the whole thing himself. And there are many writers who take credit for that particular speech, which is one of the highlights of the film. But that, uh, that I, I, I wish I had written it. That's one of the many things in the movie I wish I had written. Um, they did, David Brown, with the collusion of Spielberg, chose to cast me in the movie because I was getting uh, a lot of publicity for the picture doing ABC television shows about Jaws and about sharks and about the making of the picture. And so I played a television reporter, which was what I was doing for a living then anyway. It wasn't exactly a stretch. Um, but that little bit on the beach took days, days to do. They had a dolly track here going this way and that way. Wendy and our two children were, were in the scene. There are things you would never see there. The producers were standing and screaming on the, on the jetty, stop this, stop this madness. People were threatening suicide. It was, it was a, a long and horrible experience, but I, I had to, I, I was only party to one little bit of it. I'll tell you the one, one story that I, I do recall having done, I was told to interview Robert Shaw for ABC, and I, I did. Um, I was told to catch him earlier in the day rather than later, and for whatever reason, um, I, I was unable to catch him early in the day, and we uh, got him in the early afternoon, and we sat in the orca, and Robert looked at me, and back and forth and started to tell a story about his wife and a donkey she had owned at one time. And then he finally stopped and he looked at me and he said, did you write this book? And I said, yes. And he said, piece of crap. <laughs> so that was, the, that was my first experience with Robert Shaw, which made me want to leave right away. <laughs> But my experience with this uh, in the f filming was, was really as nothing compared to, to Carl's. And so I will turn over for a few minutes for, for Carl's to tell you his rather more close experience than mine. Uh, talking about the scar comparing scene in the boat in which the uh, Indianapolis speech is, is a major part, but it's, it's part of a larger scene. <clears throat> 
I've decided as, I, as uh, we were sitting here that I, the good thing to do would be to, at each one of these events reveal something that's not in the book or that I haven't revealed or something that I'm reminded of just as a result of participating in the weekend. And, and uh, Peter reminds me of, a, of an untold uh, Indianapolis speech story, uh, again related to Shaw's uh, love of, of uh, the grain or the, the, the alcohol. He was a drinker, let's, let's be frank. <laughs> Robert, Robert liked his drink. And the scene was scheduled to be filmed over two days in order to get the coverage of the, all the actors and the interior of the boat and wide shots and masters and two shots and close-ups. <clears throat> and the Indianapolis speech, Robert's big close-up was the first day. And there was real whiskey in his cup. Really? And he drank. And it got later in the day and later in the day. And he began to go off script. Now these are the words he wrote himself. And he was off book and wandering and improvising wildly and talking about Nako Nolans and kind of getting Craig Kingsbury stories mixed up in his own life and combining his life and Craig Kingsbury's. <laughs> and finally we said cut. You know, that was the, the end of that. And Robert abashed because he, he knew he wasn't completely present as an actor for much of the scene, said to Stephen, look, I, I, I can do it better, Stephen. I can do it better. And Stephen said, I hope so because, you know, we're coming back. We're, we're doing it again tomorrow. And, they, and, and, and we're doing it without alcohol, Robert. No alcohol. Robert said, okay, you're, you're right, Governor. So the next day they shot the scene dry. You know, just an actor, classically trained, working at the top of his form. And Verna Fields, who won an Academy Award for editing, has cut together takes from day one, drunk, to day two, sober, and they're in the same scene, and you can't tell the difference except for this one thing, which I've never shared before today. If you look very closely at Robert's close-ups, the ones where his eyes are watery is day one. <laughs> and where his eyes are clear is day two. But the cutting back and forth is, is superb, and the scene, as it turns out, plays beautifully, and it's a tribute to all the writers who worked on it, uh, including Robert Shaw, who did the, the real donkey work and, and lifted it up and made it his own. And whenever everybody talks about having written that scene or any part of it, uh, I remind everybody, who do you believe? The guy who wasn't there and tells you he wrote it, or the guy who was there and tells you he didn't. So, um, and then the production was, you know, full of. I mean, you know, Robert Shaw had a bullet fired through his door by some disgruntled islander. Well, there was a real town and gown conflict here, uh, and there was uh, half the island didn't want us here, and uh, Bob Carroll and everybody who sold stuff did want us here because <laughs> they sold a lot of stuff. And, and we, we had a, a great time. Uh, and looking around here, I, I'm reminded of, of, of folks who I haven't seen for a great many years. Edith Blake, who took a lot of pictures and, and put out a competing book over which I was furious. How dare they put out another book about the making of Jaws? And then there was a third guy who came out with a book about the making of Jaws. And then I realized if, if the film can sustain that much additional activity, you know, hooray for all of us and you know, may, may we all do well and prosper. Although I, I, at the time I was muttering to myself and checking the bestseller list to see if is Edith Blake on there. Okay, no, no, is, am I on there? Yeah, okay. Um, and, I'm, I'm, and some of these stories turn up on the DVD and the special material and everyone has their own memories, which is the most astonishing thing. I was convinced until a month ago that uh, Roy Scheider had ad-libbed, we're going to get a bigger boat. Then I pick up Vineyard Magazine and I read an in a contemporary interview done within the last two months with Roy Scheider, who says, oh no, that was in the script. I didn't ad-lib that. I did some other ad-libs, but that was in the script. Now I've got to revise my whole life experience <laughs> and start claiming credit for that line, because I've always been able to say, no, no, I didn't, I didn't write that, that ad-lib that. Uh, and I, I remind everybody that when an actor has a character that's been carefully crafted for that actor, and if the writer has done his or her job in writing a complete character, 
When it comes time for the actor to ad lib or if the actor feels suddenly inspired to add a line of dialogue, if the actor is doing his or her job in fully inhabiting the character, they will ad lib in character. And who created that character? The writer. So, you know, in, in the beginning was the word, as they say, and writers don't, uh, actors don't make up the dialogue as they go along. It's all carefully written down. They memorize it and they say it. And the genius of actors is they, they give you the illusion that it's for the first time. When they say a line, it's as if they just thought of it. Uh, and that's the art and the genius that actors bring to film and, and to the stage. So we're all much in debt to them. But writers are the artists of original creation, and directors and cameramen and composers and actors are the actors uh, are the artists of interpretation. And it's a slightly different business. And, and, and I'm an artist in, in this particular film of adaptation, uh, and Peter was the artist of original creation. Now, since Jaws, uh, I worked on Jaws 2 and Jaws 3D. I had nothing to do with Jaws 4. Uh, I want that very clear. Uh, and I remind you of the iron law of sequels. Only the last one loses money. That's why you've got Police Academy 12. <laughs> Only the last sequel loses money. So when they got, they got to four, they lost money, they stopped. Uh, but two and three were written under similar circumstances. They started without a script. Well, they had a script, but they didn't like it, and then realized they didn't like it after they started shooting and prepping the picture. So in both cases, I got a call at the last minute because I'm sure people said to themselves, well, let's get somebody who can come to location, drop everything he's doing, work on a film that he hasn't seen the script for, and you know, perhaps he'll make it coherent where it hasn't been yet. And then, luckily enough, I was able to do that with director Jeannot Swark, and on 3D with director Joe Alves, who was with us all the way and, and was responsible for so much of the design and visual elements and second unit direction on, uh, on the first two. So the, all the, and, and a lot of those, those folks are here today, which is fabulous. And you go on and you have a career. I wrote another hit movie that became something of an icon, uh, The Jerk with Steve Martin. Thank you. <laughs> and, and, and as I slide into being a senior Writers Guild vice president and you know, the, the, attending to writers' issues and getting less and less involved in the making of motion pictures. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm re resigned to being a, a Jeopardy category. Hits that begin with a J. <laughs> <laughs> Who was Carl Gottlieb? Uh, <laughs> uh, Larry Gelbart, the writer who created the television series MASH, among other wonderful, wonderful plays and films, Larry Gilbert said it, he knew it was time for him to think about retirement. He said, I just went to a network meeting on a new project and there were fetuses in suits <laughs> <laughs> talking to me. Uh, so we, we only can hope that the generation of fetuses in suits who are running the business uh, will rediscover some of what it is that we do because they have rediscovered what people have done because they only make comics, old movies, remakes of movies, and adaptations of best-selling novels. Uh, the, uh, the notion that an original script might get to the screen as a big tentpole picture, not as an independent feature or as a small picture, the, uh, the idea of a big picture getting to the screen without some identifiable roots uh, is for the time being, a dream. Well, that's the depressing side of it. The, ex <laughs> the exciting side of it is that the business keeps making movies. They, they keep showing them worldwide. Uh, it's, be it's part of the popular culture as never before. The new technology, the DVDs, that include so much material that was never available to, to people who enjoyed films. Uh, you know, unless you were an insider, you never got to see outtakes and, and uh, hear the additional 
comments of the directors or actors or writers of the film. Now you can study a film the way you can study a great book because of all the commentaries that are attached to it. And, and that makes life interesting. Peter, of course, went a different way. And I'm going to ask him now to talk about the fish and all the fishes like it who have taken a very bum rap and uh, Peter's spent a good part of the last 20 years uh, making up for a pop popular misconceptions and misinterpretations of his original work. So, Peter. I, I reject the atonement notion. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but uh, talking about when it was time to retire from the film business, I, I've, I have had several reasons to retire. Once was the first time I heard, didn't you used to be Peter Benchley? <laughs> and then finally that goes into, didn't you used to be somebody? <laughs> the answer to which is always no, no, I, I really didn't. I went on and wrote a bunch more novels. Uh, there was one also with Robert Shaw that was... A, a modest hit called The Deep with <laughs> and he was equally wonderful in that um, and uh, not, not, not really handicapped in any major way he did, he did a truly wonderful job and I was basically invulnerable I, I had two hits in a row I couldn't possibly fail which is this myth in the movie business if you have one hit you're a fluke. If you have two hits, you're, you're amazing and you're the person to hang everybody's hat on. I had two hits and I was golden. And so I had a third movie made and it was a flop. And I couldn't get my phone calls returned anymore. All of a sudden, you know, literally overnight, there was one weekend the movie opened and by Monday I wasn't getting my phone calls returned suddenly you realize that uh, the, the great experience I, I'd had on Jaws and on the Deep uh, really was, was more fantasy than reality. But the great thing that Jaws gave me, aside from putting my children through college, school, everything else, uh, was freedom and the freedom to go off and learn about what I'd written about. And ABC came to me between the book and the movie and said, hey, you've written all this about great white sharks. Would you like to go swim with them? And I paused a little bit and I said, Sh well, sure, sure, I guess so. And um, if I could take with me one of the people who was in Blue Water, White Death, which is the great documentary about sharks that some of you may have seen. So I had a neighbor named Stan Waterman, who was one of the cameramen on that film. And he and I and Wendy went to South Australia and we filmed Great White Sharks and got in the cage with them for the first time I'd ever done it. And <clears throat> very few people had by that time. And because nothing can go wrong, something went wrong, and the shark got wrapped up in the, the, the rope, keeping the cage to the boat, took the cage under the boat, and was beating it to pieces. And everybody on the boat taking pictures of this was saying, yo, man, far out, now, that, whoa, look there, far out. And got the cameras down there. And only Wendy, who had been banished to the flybridge, because she was a woman in Australia, where women were always banished, um, uh, she saw what was going on and she jumped down and she grabbed the rope and the shark at this time was coming up the rope and she grabbed the rope and started calling the shark names and the cameramen are still going far out you know and the shark is grunting and spitting blood from the chum in the water and his eyes are rolled back it looks like a maniac and she finally shook the rope free and it was no big thing for everybody but me and her um, but this was my first experience with great white sharks in the, in the water. And I went on because ABC's American Sportsman wanted people in certain fields to go do things in other fields. They wanted a baseball player to go be a fly fisherman uh, or uh, a movie actor to go be a mountain climber. And in this case, they wanted anybody to go swim with sharks. And <laughs> nobody would do it except the lowest of the low, a writer. <laughs> So they got the writer and they kept asking me to go do these shows, which turned out to be the greatest thing for Wendy and me ever, because we got to go all over the world and dive with all of these wonderful animals and to learn about the plight of the oceans. As more and more, 30 years ago, there were a great many sharks in the ocean. 
I don't know if some of you have seen the statistics, some of you who live here would certainly know them, that in the Atlantic, for every single shark, that, that, for every 30 sharks that lived 30 years ago, let me take this whole sentence from the top, there are less than 10% of the sharks alive today that there were 30 years ago. They've been reduced, the populations of sharks and other large fish have been reduced by 90% in the last 30 years. 90%. So all the blue sharks we used to see around here in Nantucket, where I grew up, they're not there anymore. The makos, the whites, the basking sharks in the summertime, they're not there. Populations of billfish, tuna are all declining. And so as the, we became more aware of this, the shows that I was doing and the books that I was writing became more and more attuned to the environment and to trying to, to press the message home that the oceans are not as invulnerable as we thought they were and we really have to do something about this. So that's what I've been doing for the past 30 years, really is, is turning my life around into becoming more of a marine conservationist and writing. I wrote a couple of comedies uh, in the meantime, and uh, then I wrote a thing that became a mini-series called Beast about a giant squid. Um, then I ran out of, of big ocean creatures. So, um, but basically for the past 10 years, I've been concentrating on marine conservation and I have here about 12 or 15 minutes of film that I wanted to show you from a show that I did for the Geographic a few years ago um, in which basically the message is how little we still know about great white sharks, how much there is to learn. And aside from the, the practical point of view of not wiping out animals worldwide, the amount aesthetically and academically and intellectually we have to learn from and about these animals is staggering. So I'm going to just set this up for you. We, we went searching for great white sharks on the 25th anniversary of Jaws, sort of, a little later then. And we went to, the, at the time, the three places they were to be known, South Africa, where we were just, as you'll see, we were just discovering remarkable behavior never before seen, South Australia, where they had been seen, and the coast of California, which there we'd gotten, had no luck there. So what, what you're going to see here is we've been to South Africa. We've said very little luck with white sharks. We know that they're, being in, they're in decline. And now we've gone to South Africa. We've heard that white sharks do an unprecedented thing. This is a 3,000 pound animal that apparently breaches. It, in, in, in prey, in predation, it shoots off the bottom and like a rocket ship comes up and breaches out of the water whole body out of the water, which nobody believed. So with David Dubelay, the National Geographic photographer, myself, Rodney Fox, who was a white shark attack survivor, and I can't think of the others, a couple of scientists, we went to South Africa and looking for this breaching behavior and one other thing. And so if you'll run this film, it starts just as David is getting his first film, uh, first shots of the shark breaching. And it goes on for about 12 minutes and they'll stop it. How do you buy universal stock? <laughs> and that, that was the first indication of again popularity. But then Vernon Fields, her genius was 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 just really remarkable. I, she asked me to sit. Stephen asked me to sit and look at every frame of shark footage to make sure it looked realistic. But then you know the affirmation comes, as Carl said, when the people who, who make sausage really appreciate it. Anyone else? Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, 
No, the, the question was, was this anything that I did based on the shark attacks in uh, Manuscore Inlet in uh, the, the creek in New Jersey? And it was not. Um, no, I did not. It had nothing to do with that, although people like to think that it did. So I had heard about them, but that was all. Anything else? Oh, yes. After the short time you've seen you, after celebrations, I can answer the first better than the second because Carl worked with Stephen for months and I, I, the press loved making a fight out of the Stevens and my relationship. And it, every time we spoke to, about, to or about one another, the press had it that I was calling him a moron and he was calling my book a piece of garbage and this, that, and the other. And none of it, none of it was true. Uh, we got along very nicely. Stephen at one point said that he didn't like the ending of the book. A perfectly fair comment because the ending of the book would make a lousy movie. And um, that came back to me as Spielberg says your book is a piece of excrement, and, which he had never said. So I responded like a jerk, and we had this kind of thing. But I worked very well with him, and I didn't work very long with him because I turned in the two or three drafts of the script that I did, and it was very clear to Stephen that he was going to have to go to a professional screenwriter. Um, and at that point, I realized right away that books and movies are different critters altogether. Yeah. And then uh, Howard Sackler, who I never met, we were serial collaborators. Uh, Howard Sackler, who had written Great White Hope and was a yachtsman and a sailor, uh, knew about the Indianapolis, figured out that was a, a, motive, a good motivation for Quinn, found the mon who created a monologue <coughs> that existed in his script and in all the subsequent scripts. Uh, and then I inherited uh, a script that was you know, a completed script that had been budgeted and boarded and scheduled. Uh, and then we just, with the recklessness of youth, Stephen and I just you know, took it apart 10 days before we started shooting and made this other movie that had a lot of similarities to the script, but was different. And we had uh, just the, the chutzpah of youth. There's a, there's a production meeting that takes place just before the start of every every film, every television show. It's, it usually occurs about two or three days before principal photography. The whole, all the key department heads, you know, props, grip, selected, camera, uh, special effects, all meet, and the, they, they read through the script. You go through the script scene by scene, reaffirming everything that's going to be, we'll need this effect here, or the shark is going to have to do this here. And we had just rewritten the movie, and all I had was three pages scotch tape together of the outline of the film. And Stephen and I sat in front of Bill Gilmore and Joe and all these way experienced hands who had done hundreds of films to our you know, three. And, and we said, okay, Lighthouse, we're not going to be there. You don't have to address the inside of the Lighthouse. We're going to be more days in the house. We're going to be a couple more days in the interior of the boat. Over here, we're not going to do this. Over here on the beach. We're not. And we weren't quite sure what it was we were going to do, but we went through the script and said, these are the changes that we envisioned. And God bless the pros who said, okay, and, and you know, accommodated the changes even as they were occurring, even as they advised against us doing some things. They showed us ways to do it other ways that, that saved time and money and kept the spirit of the film. So it was, it was an adventure. Huge adventure. I don't remember hearing of any great acrimony at all. But was there? Was there between individuals? Well, there was cabin fever. I, see, I luckily got out at the end of the dialogue sequences. After two months, when my apartment as an actor was finished, after all the cover scenes had been photographed, when they had nothing left to do but shoot the ocean, I got to go home. They stayed for two and a half more months, going out to get 30 seconds, 10 seconds, six seconds of usable film a day, and sometimes days with no footage, and there, there was a food fight, there was some shouting, there was some bad feeling, but it's the, the enmity of the foxhole and, and the frat house. I mean, you, you wind up fighting a larger enemy, which is the completion of the film, 
when you've, when you've done that, then all is forgiven. Uh, so it worked out okay. Yes. That's true, yes. For every human being killed, there are roughly 10. The 100 million sharks are being killed by mostly by the finning industry. Um, so the, it's, it's a losing battle, and there's very great fear that some species of sharks will be extinguished, commercially if not actually. So that um, in the past 20 years, 10 years, the, the technology has completely outstripped the resource. They can now kill some of the long lines that are being used are 80 miles long, and they have hooks every 100 feet or so. So you've got you're killing thousands and thousands of animals indiscriminately. It's it is a problem that has nothing whatsoever to do with jaws. Uh, it has to do with technology and the rapaciousness of, of our breed. Yes. Uh, no, he was he he and about six other guys were the inspiration. As as all characters, um, especially colorful characters, they're they're composites of other people. And I went out with with many fishing captains in my youth, of all of whom had pieces of Quint. And I met a guy in California who swears to me that he was Quint, and that I went fishing with him in 1968. Absolute fiction. The entire thing was a fiction. I never went fishing with him. I never met the man. But he's Quint, so no, certainly not. He was part of it. Yeah, Frank Mundus wrote a book called Sport Fishing for Shark, which was one of the books that I, I consulted when we were putting the movie together. Yeah. He, was a, he was a big, colorful shark fisherman at that time, and he, he benefited hugely from the publicity that he generated for himself. And I think that, uh, his, his, his genius was as much in self-promotion as it was catching fish. <laughs> Ray over there, there's a lady who's had her hand up. Oh. <laughs> story that will turn us right off in an hour, and I think that's a perfect way to end. That's a story more about the film industry than it is about Jaws, but years and years ago, Sam Goldwyn, the legendary producer who helped found Metro Golden Mayor, was uh, kind of accosted by a critic named Stanley Kaufman who wrote about film for the nation. And Kaufman said to Goldwyn, he said, look, Mr. Goldwyn, you know, you should be ashamed of yourself. And Goldwyn said, for what? Calvin said, for making such trash in such quantity, here you have film, a global institution that is capable of changing lives, changing how people feel about themselves and about the institutions and the politics, and all you do is churn out populist crap, one film after another, and Goldman said, wait a minute, wait a minute, he says, grant me that once a year we make a good picture. Calvin says, once a year, twice a year, this was back in the 50s, Hollywood makes 500 feature films a year, and, and you could have the opportunity, you've got the greatest talents and writers and photographers, and Golden held up his hand and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, answer me this, even by your standards, Mr. Calvin, by your standards, grant me that once a year, Hollywood makes a good picture. So Calvin says, all right, I'll grant you, once a year, Hollywood makes a good picture. Good picture. And Golden says, remember, he says, we don't have to.
and the film was in its final stages of completion, and the head popping out of the bottom of the boat, uh, the shot that Craig Kingsbury said, I don't understand how a shark eats somebody and spits the head back into the boat. <laughs> but nonetheless, that was, that was the moment, that was the beat that Stephen wanted. Uh, that's what we wrote, that's what we what he shot. And he wasn't happy with the way it was in the film at that point. The film was finished. The studio was, you know, we were cutting the film, we were going to lock the negative. Stephen said, I really want to make that shot again. The studio said, no, we're not going to put together a crew and go to the tank on the back lot. So Stephen said, I'll pay for it myself. And I don't believe he actually did, but he said he would. And a kind of a little guerrilla conspiracy, which was possible in the days of big studio operations where the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. They went to the back lot, they acutely put the boat on a truck and then took the head. No, Joe was there. Joe built the boat. Joe reconstructed the set, because we, that's right, because we couldn't get it off the lot, Teamsters wouldn't bring it. But, yeah, I know, but it was, <laughs> and he reminds us of Stephen. Well, Stephen was, was cheap. Stephen was a poor tipper. <laughs> Joe, built, Joe built the boat in his backyard. <sighs> yes, that's right. Bill Gilmore, who's here now, wouldn't have allowed it had he known that we were doing it. And they got, they got Rex Spence as a favor because he was the underwater photographer who had gotten a lot of work shooting for the studio. They said, come on, Rex, you work, you know, we got you so much work, you'll come, you'll do this one shot. So they went out to Verner's swimming pool, which is a small pool, you know, not like a swimming pool, it was a little pool, it was like an 18-foot, kidney-shaped little 50s swimming pool. Uh, put the boat into it, tarped it over with the visqueen and, and plastics so it was dark and we could shoot. The water wasn't quite the right consistency, so they went out and got a half gallon of milk and poured it in the pool to give it that cloudy consistency that we photographed well. Got the, snuck the head out of the studio, brought it down, put it in the boat, put you know, Boats in the water, heads in the water. <laughs> Rex Pence is in the water. He got a head, our head, and he, to quote Dylan. And, and, uh, and they made the shot. And after a couple of takes, it was the shot that Stephen wanted. And that's the shot that went into the movie. And that's the shot that's the biggest physical move the audience makes in two hours. And Stephen and I and my ex-wife uh, it was then my wife Alice, when we were out for dinner on a Thursday night in midsummer, we knew what time the head would pop. <laughs> <laughs> and we took it out and watched it on the evening, you know, the 8 o'clock show, the head came at 9.02. So we, we finished dinner, go down to the theater where the manager knew us, because we did this more than once. We'd go into, we'd go, go into the back of the theater and just stand there, and you know, the, the moment would come, the head would pop, and you, we'd watch. 1,200 people in the orchestra of the theater on Hollywood Boulevard would watch 1,200 people go, whoo! <laughs> <laughs> they would just levitate and come down. <laughs> and then we'd you know, high five each other and go out. <laughs> Question back there, and then we'll stop. <laughs> Somebody's going to have to relay the question to me. I didn't hear it. If you were to have written a sequel to Jaws, what kind of story would you have done? Where would you have sent it? I was asked to do it, and I submitted a, a, a suggestion of a sequel about that turned out to be about uh, the ancestor of Jaws. Um, which scientists at that time conceived might still be alive, called Megalodon, uh, Carcharodon Megalodon, about the, the mother of all sharks, and uh, it was a terrible idea. And the person took it down. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. For Guys, thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also, be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter. TikTok and Instagram and be sure to check out our website thedailyjaws.com. Until next time, we drink to your legs, farewell and adieu.